Hey, welcome back to Talk Gnosis for our three-part series, four-part series, endless series on <laughs> the secret book of John. Uh, before we get right back into it, uh, give us money on Patreon because we can't do the show without it. Patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month or just a buck. You can put a limit on it. Also, tell people about the show or don't give us money if you can't. Just tell people about the show. Uh, your Excellency. So... We, uh, weeks ago, months ago, we, uh, we did an excellent show, and, uh, you did a great wrap-up. There are still some things left on set. Right. Right, well, I mean, one of the things you, you wanted to touch on, I guess, was, uh, was temple theology. The first temple perspective. Yes. Um, so, I'm gonna come to that. But first, I'm gonna pause because I think Min needed something from me. Okay. Um, so I just left a pause there so you could cut it out. But I think Thank you. maybe he's gone already. Maybe he's gone already. I think it's, hang on a sec. Okay, come back Min. 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 What did you say? Oh, thanks. More edit points. So the temple perspective on Secret John is, I, I suspect, helpful and important in some ways and also confusing in some ways because that's how temple stuff works. Yeah. So when I say temple stuff, I'm talking about Margaret Barker and I think we've talked about that on a talk nice show at some point. We sure have, but I'll link it in the, uh, the, in the uh, description below. Yeah. In the notes, and I've got I've got talks on um, the Joanite channel as well about it. If people want to look into it, but the basic the basic hypothesis the basic hypothesis is that there's a there's a fundamental dynamic in um, in Hebrew life around the time around this kind of period, the sort of like the couple of centuries, you know, BCE to CE. Um, there's a fundamental dynamic that that comes from this moment just prior to the Babylonian captivity where there's a king called Josiah. Josiah kind of does a, performs a fundamental transformation of what, um, what the Hebrew religious picture is. And he suppresses the way Hebrew religion has been practiced up to that point in favor of um, a more regulated, a more Jerusalem centered and a more, um, kind of masculinist version of, of Hebrew religion. So he, um, and, and that's what we come to understand as Hebrew religion from that point forward. Yeah. To some extent. And I'm using my terms fairly carefully because Judaism is a, is a thing that happens somewhat later, right? Exactly. It's really only proper to talk about. I think it's really only proper to talk about Judaism as a thing that emerges after the destruction of the second temple and the and the, the jewish diaspora right oh i i've got a rant about that so well basically that's a rant i really hate the phrase second temple judaism because you cannot have that that is an oxymoron <laughs> there's no judaism till the uh, uh uh till the second temple falls yeah and it's a development that comes out of that so this is this is this this hypothesis is margaret barker's hypothesis and and like the the fact of Josiah and the the reforms he proposes are recorded in the, the historical portion of the of the Hebrew Bible, it's not really under serious debate. Um, I think there's external evidence for for his reign. Yep. Um, he does that, so he does a bunch of things. He suppresses the worship of anybody outside of the central temple cult in Jerusalem itself, which means worship was happening in lots of other temples because otherwise he wouldn't have had to suppress it. He suppresses the worship of a feminine divine figure, um, who's worshipped both in the temples but also tops of mountains and in sacred groves which means that was happening because if it wasn't happening he wouldn't have had to suppress it um, <laughs> um and he promulgates this book which lays down a law um which means that wasn't the fundamental thing prior to Yosiah because if it had been he wouldn't have had to have promulgated it right so so there's a bunch of sort of implicit statements about the ways things got fundamentally changed so it's an interesting historical moment like he did that stuff 
and that was um, continued by his son, his successor as, as king of Judea. Um, and that might have been that, you know, like there's all kinds of kings happen through the history of nations that do these kinds of things and then they're swept away, you know. The, the Akhenaten reforms in Egypt didn't really take. <laughs> well, right? Um, maybe his name would have been wiped from the effigies in the temple surrounds and that would have been that and who knows. But a really interesting thing happened. So those, those changes occurred, carried on by his son, and then the Babylonians invaded um, and, and made um, the, the whole kingdom a, a vassal state and took the Jews captive. Now, I, that's not, you know, a whole people is rarely taken captive by anyone in the history of invasion. Yeah. What, what you generally do is take the, you know, you take the aristocracy and the royal family and you take the, the social elite and they become hostages in the foreign land. But we know some... the Babylonians did this from other sources. Yeah, they, they would take the elites. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what you do. That's what you do. What you do. Because yeah. someone's going to keep mining the, the metals and someone's going to keep farming the cows and someone's going to keep planting the crops and you don't want to import a whole bunch of workers from somewhere else. You want to use the people that are there. So, yep. so what that means is that regular Hebrews stayed exactly where they were. This is essentially what happened in Spain, you know, in the Al Andalus period and later during the Reconquista, the ordinary people would say exactly where they are and the, the aristocracy and the priesthood get moved around, right? Yep. So regular Hebrew stayed exactly where they are and um, probably kept practicing the faith of their fathers because all this rigmarole happening in the temple in Jerusalem didn't affect most people. It didn't, no. <laughs> it didn't penetrate their ordinary lives. Well, so they kept doing what they were doing. Yeah, if you, especially if you think about the ancient world where, you know, you didn't go more than five kilometers outside of, you know, <laughs> where you lived. You know, that was the average. So then the priesthood from the temple who've been subject to these reforms, right? And then there's presumably been some kind of purging of the priesthood and under Josiah and his son. Um, but that's the, that purged, re reformed priesthood, right? The, that's, that's been through this sort of, Barker calls it a cultural revolution Vexed, but anyway, um, that's the priesthood that gets taken to Babylon yeah. for two, three generations yeah. and then returns, right? What they do in Babylon, like a lot of changes happen to Hebrew religion in Babylon, and, and that's not controversial. Like, that's, a, that's yeah. a really, you know, it was a transformational moment, that captivity, um, because that brings Hebrew thought into encounter with Babylonian thought, um, particularly with. Babylonian thinking around astrology and the planets and all that kind of stuff. Um, it fundamentally changes the way everything is understood in that encounter, but it's also, it's a snapshot of that, that different form of Hebrew religion that Josiah was keen to create. That's what gets taken away to Babylon, refined into its final form and then returned to Israel. Um, thanks to the Darius, the great, uh, yeah. the Persian liberation of Israel. But what they come back to is a people who kind of just reset to what they were doing before Yesiah ever happened, right? Like his, yeah. everything that he done was he did was kind of swept away, and and um, that was that. So then you, it's interesting. You've got this. Well, okay. So it's important to kind of like what Barker does in her work, quite painstakingly and over over more than a decade, is to try to reconstruct what were the what were the key points of what that first temple. Um, theology and mysticism may have been like um yep it's, it's difficult to do and she takes quite some effort to do it but she comes up with some key points right so there's a divine great lady um uh the the single god that we see in the later period there's there's two gods there's one god who's incarnate as the the king who is also the high priest of the temple and there's a higher god who's more transcendent and is never you know the, the king is called emmanuel the the god among us and then there's the high god who's who's above um and the the yahweh this is later yod -Heh -Vav -Heh, this is later referred to so what happens in the later period is the is el the most god most high and yod -Heh -Vav -Heh, the the national god of the people of Israel, really, who's incarnate as the king, get smushed together and made into a single deity in the later period. 
that that's the reform that returns from Babylon. But in the earlier period, they're distinct beings, and Yod Hey Vav Hey is the son of the Great Lady and God Most High. And and so and so when the the king is enthroned as the high priest, he becomes you know <laughs> this eternity descends upon him and he becomes the incarnation of Yodhe Vavhe for the people. He's God among us. Um, and so mysticism in that, in that temple uh, vibe is kind of someone coming into that same encounter with that sense of union, that, that undifferentiated wholeness that's represented by the Holy of Holies in the temple. Um, that's most dramatically carried out by the high priest and, and you see it sort of dramatically reenacted in the, the day, the ancient day of atonement ritual and blah, 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 blah. There's, there's a lot of bits and pieces to it, but the shape of, of the, the theology, of the religion, the way mysticism works that Barker points to what she's trying to do. She's a Methodist. She, what she's trying to do is kind of say, people keep saying that Christianity is some kind of neoplatonic thing smushed onto. I don't know if that's true because actually, if you look back at this first temple religion, you know, there's a Trinity, and there's a there's a great lady and looks just like the the shape that Marian theology takes on in the first second century first and second centuries kind of um, the shape of it all is very similar to the shape that we see what we're calling Christianity taking on the thing that Jesus seems to be teaching in Palestine in that in that first century. So I think what he's doing is reviving that first temple version of Hebrew religion, or teaching that back to the people of Jerusalem and Galilee. When perhaps they haven't heard that in a while, maybe, or maybe it's remembered in a in a kind of a dim form. Yes. So that's the temple hypothesis. So the crucial thing, though, is that you've got these two versions of Hebrew religion. There's one that has this higher god and lower god that has this divine feminine figure um, that sees the that, that's more about this sort of um, harmonious sense of consent with the divine as being the ways the way in which god's will is carried out in the world that sees our role as human beings coming into a, a path of union with the divine is one depiction of it and the other depiction of hebrew religion is this it's about written down laws and rules that are in a particular book and it's about following the laws and it's about everything centralized in jerusalem and it's about just a single god and nobody else and that's that right yeah i shall have, have no other gods before me and we i mean we know we know that the form of those first five books, the Tanakh, that happened quite late in the piece, like it, that happened during the Babylonian captivity, that those books were consolidated, the various source texts were consolidated into what we now know as the Tanakh. The, the pre-existing texts are much older, but it takes its final form in Babylon. Yeah, and, and, and Barker's overall thesis is controversial, um, but the the major parts of it are accepted by 99.9% .9 of scholars. So as, as you mentioned, King Josiah's uh, uh, reforms, uh, you know, that, that it, it reformed an earlier form of Hebrew religion, uh, uh, made it more rules-based, uh, uh, um, that, that is, you know, 100% accepted by almost all scholars. Not, uh, not so, yeah, yeah, but, but the, broad, uh, the broad brush strikes are not seriously content. Yeah. Exactly. But the, the particular way that she puts it together, the particular, and, and she says that she's doing theology, by the way, not religious studies, which, but, uh, you know, that that's a bit of a cheat because she is also doing history, uh, but, but whatever. And, um, you know, I, I don't speak or, or read Hebrew or Greek, but I, I, I think she's brilliant, uh, you know, but I, I think a valid criticism of her is that but she does some very creative etymologies, and just with the very basics that I know, yeah, I can, yeah, she's uh, twisting, no. yeah, there's a little bit there that, that might be a bit of a stretch. But overall, of course, as people who watch and listen to the show know, uh, I'm a pretty big fan of, of Barker's work. Right. Um, yeah. Well, she has this, you name check this, uh, you, you dropped this term that she likes to use before. She talks about a certain text being temple talk, that there's yes. some some giveaway things in certain texts and she picks out um the ezekiel material and she picks out this Najamadi material and she picks out the enochian the books of enoch and um, a lot of the qumran material is temple talk right they're they're, they're talking about the vision of divinity that that you get when you're engaged in the practice of temple mysticism yeah um so she points directly at the gnostic material and in fact directly at secret john as as temple talk Okay, so 
if you were living in a world like if there were multiple temples in which god was worshipped prior to yesiah right and yesiah's concern was to centralize worship in jerusalem and and let's say he destroyed all the temples in um israel and judea yep okay great um he can't get to Arabia and he can't get to Egypt because that's not his kingdom. So if you were going to find other temples in which we knew there were Hebrew peoples, probably also worshipping um, also worshipping God Most High, where would one find them? The other places in which Hebrew people lived. And we know that Hebrew people lived in, we know that Hebrew people lived in Persia. And we know that Hebrew people lived in Arabia. And we know that Hebrew people lived in Egypt. And we absolutely, certainly, definitely, 100% know they lived in Alexandria. So... There is a gospel story about Jesus, Mary, and Joseph fleeing to Egypt to escape the persecution of Herod. So if Jesus were to pick up some religious tradition, um, you know, there's all sorts of esoteric y Freemason y stuff about Jesus the, picking up. The, the, there it's, could be an alternate version of the Gospel of John where he goes to Egypt and studies stuff. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. indeed. Um, if he was going to be picking up that that good old first temple religion, then one of the places where he might legitimately pick that up is in Egypt. Yeah. So then if one were to return and one's faced with these two conflicting views of what Hebrew religion is meant to be, right, in which one of them is transcendent and mystical and um, in, interested in this idea of, of the covenantal relationship between the divine and the world as being one of, of consent and um, discernment and harmony, harmony and the weaving together of the bonds between heaven and earth as one view and the other view being dictatorial written down rules single god who claims there are no other gods despite the fact that we all know there were um you know completely divorced from the feminine etc um if one were to dramatize that in a narrative what might that narrative look like right yeah and in particular like the you can't lose wisdom, right? Wisdom is a really pivotal figure in all Hebrew religion, but the version of wisdom that comes back from Babylon is this really kind of like emaciated, kind of thin down version of wisdom. She's still there. I mean, she's still there in, in Proverbs and um, and the, the other wisdom books, but but it's very thin and it's very and it, it keeps pointing back to the to Deuteronomy really like you know wisdom is understanding all the statutes and regulations that's what wisdom really is it's, it's understanding all the statutes and regulations so it's a sort of a versus the transcendent like cause you know heaven spanning view of what she was in the first temple version this sort of secondary wisdom is this kind of like you know twisted up not really quite right version of wisdom you know Almost like a fallen wisdom, oh, like an Akamoth, or... <laughs> oh, I can tell you're getting excited because we are getting some more scratches on your mic, by the way. So, oh, so yeah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> There's lots of gesturing. So, yeah, I, I think I think the people who have watched That's... our last two shows, the people who have read Secret John, are, are, are really starting to see some to see where this is going, like see some strong similarities, just from the outline that you said, it fits so well to text. Right. So there's a... Yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, and I think it makes sense yeah. of, like, the, the great puzzle of, like, the, the polemic character of the Gnostic material is one of the things that's attention-grabbing over against most other material from that period, right? Like, it's, it's, it's the, the parody structure, the mirroring in the narrative, all these sort of, and the higher God and the lower God, and the, the lower God is a bit messed up, right? Like, what, what's up with that? That's the yeah. thing that gets everyone's attention. It got the heresiologist's attention. It still gets people's attention today. Where did that come from? Why did that happen? Why is that there? And I think the temple hypothesis is a compelling argument for how that got there in the first place. Yes. But it doesn't exhaust the text, right? Like you can't read Secret John and go, oh, well, it's just first temple versus second temple. That's all it's saying. Because it's clearly not all it's saying. No. Various things are problematic. Um, in this interpretation, so one oh, is the... no, sorry, we, we we didn't mention uh, for those at home that uh, that she saw that that the first temple before King Josiah's uh, 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 reforms, right, uh, the, embraced this form of of Hebrew religion, and uh, particularly not not just after the reforms, because of course you know the temple's been destroyed. The second temple is really, really, really lacking uh, these qualities that that King Josiah pushed out. 
right? So you, you sort of have a temple that is remembered as being good, holy, unified. It is a uh, it is a model of the universe uh, um, where man and the divine can meet, uh, and it, it, it contains full revelation. But the second temple is almost a parody of the first temple. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah. Ruled by a bad dictatorial, you know, Herod. Herod's the one that finishes the second. The Herod's temple. the one who finishes it. The dictatorial king who finishes yeah. the temple, who completes the model of creation, and it's a broken model of creation. Right? It's a broken model of creation. Um, yeah. And so, so two major religious streams emerge from the destruction of the second temple. One is the thing we call the the various things that we call Christianity, and the other is yeah. the things that we call Judaism. Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, rabbinic if you Judaism. prefer. And I, yeah. I, I note that both of them kind of went, yeah, that whole second temple thing was a bad plan. Let's not do that. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. No one, no one tried to perpetuate that version of Hebrew religion, right? Like, so yeah. rabbinic Judaism like, pulls back to the synagogue and to and to you know the the kind of individual and communal engagement with with scripture and with the you know wrestling with with what God wants of us. Um, not Second Temple Judaism, right? Like it's a and it and it regret like as you watch the 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 sort of the the development and evolution of of jewish philosophy over the next few centuries there's a sense in which it's sort of almost reaching around the second temple and kind of recovering aspects of 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 a kind of a of a sensed early tradition and so the shekinah becomes very important you know so there's a recovery of the feminine occurs and there's a there's a recovery of what covenant really means in a kind of a deep personal felt sense and the kabbalah brings a lot of that that sort of um you know, debatably earlier kind of emanationist um, kind of mysticism into into Judaism, and so it it sort of repairs its it sort of repairs itself maybe or over against the kind of version that that was embodied in the in the Second Temple. Um, it's, it's a good point to bring up because uh, you, if you're just hearing about this stuff or doing a cursory reading, it, it does sound a little supersessionist, right? Uh, it, it does kind of, uh, but but that's not it at all, right? It, it's not that that Christianity and and Jesus accurately 100% capture uh, first temple religion. It's uh, it's it's spread oh. out in bits and pieces no. in well, in Christianity, uh, in Judaism, and she also says Islam. She says that they're they're siblings. There's, so there's right. these are all these are all. This is why you know the, the Abrahamic, the Noahide traditions are all siblings that emerge from the fountainhead of the of the first temple, really. Yeah, and if you consider Gnosticism um, a, a different religion uh, than uh, which some people do, I, I the, you know, and that has fallen out of favor. Um, that there are you know, I, I wake up on both sides of the bed on that one because at the end of the day, I'm a you know the, the the difference between a Christian Gnostic and a Gnostic Christian. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm I'm a Gnostic Christian, but I I do uh, uh, there's a lot that, that I could see how how it could be you know viewed a, viewed as a separate faith. But of course, we're both in a Christian church. Um, where well, was I going to, with that? But Gnostics would would also I, be a separate I, piece. I think we're gonna like that's that's kind of what I understand Joanite to mean is to kind of say, for me, Joanite means we're we're drawing from that underground stream that that yeah. waters all these various siblings in the um in the path so it yeah it, it's um yeah the the many digressions and i'm going to avoid all of them so to come back this, though this show is just one long digression so <laughs> you can feel free to go uh, go at it at any time pretty much. yeah um I'll Sorry, I, I want I want to finish one last thought, which is a complete digression. But uh, just in case for for people though who 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 are not familiar with Barker's work, it, it surprisingly backs up because you're talking about the, what being a Jonite means to you. But it surprisingly backs up a lot of mythical histories and sort of focuses and obsessions that you find in esoteric traditions in sometimes right. scary ways. And she she has no trunk with any of that. She's not familiar with that material. If I email her with some of that material she would say please leave me alone um so how did you get this email address how did Who you are? get this email address please please stop uh i, I don't want to hear about this weird esoteric stuff maybe she would who knows but it, the, the fact that that it, it it sinks so well and backs it up so well it's 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 scary uh and also makes me think oh well, that's it. okay this this the this mythical history may not be so mythical after all okay so there's sorry to interrupt you because uh, i'm sure you were starting something good but uh, uh go off 
Uh, the picture Barker paints around the the first temple is in like the the sense of what the mysticism is about and how the theology works. It it all it's all around the royal cult, really. It's the yeah. the royal family, the king as the high priest, which in the, the first temple version they were always identified and in a lot of broadly the broad sort of Canaanite Near Eastern world, that's really common for the king to be the high priest. Um but a lot of what she talks about is is the temple. It's the it's temple theology. So she's talking about the temple cult, right? Yeah. So the version that we get, like Secret John's not interested in kings. It doesn't talk about kings and high priests and priests at all. Really, it's not interested in them. It's interested in the ordinary human being. Um, I mean, Jesus. It's not really even arguable. I think in both Matthew and John, Jesus spends a great deal of time kind of just saying, "Forget the temple." That's oh yeah, the... where, where does Secret John open up again? What's what's the I, opening scene? Yeah, in the, in the temple, which then John flees, right? So yeah, yeah, the, the temple's not the point. The royal family's not the point, and and like as if to kind of like the the depiction that we get from Jesus directly is um, the Last Supper. You know, something that was must have been an amazingly theatrical atonement ritual um, in the first temple be becomes here's a cup of wine and here's some bread yes. and take and eat, take and drink, you know, in, in this we come into union. So the, the atonement is the most step down, most humble, most straightforward version of the same thing. And the, the version of mysticism isn't, you know, a prophet of the king beholding the holy of holies <laughs> and and going into visionary states. It's, it's like ordinary people undergoing um, spiritual practice in their own way and coming into various perhaps visions, perhaps contemplative states um, that, that undertake the same thing. So something happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. Between the return of captivity and which is uh, 500 BC. 500 BC. Yeah. It's Somewhere around what? then. Yeah. I will edit in the right number. So <laughs> yeah. Our mouths, our mouths will be moving, but it'll be 465 BC. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah somewhere around there, like a, several centuries um, before the Common Era. And something happens between then, somewhere, somehow, and we don't know, and there's no remainders, and we have no real clues. But somewhere between then and what Jesus is teaching, somewhere between then and what we're getting in the, in the, the text of Secret John, it goes from being, well, either the, either the temple cult and the royal cult wasn't the only manifestation of it. Maybe there was that and also sort of mysteries of, that the people participated in. And that's simply not recorded. Because why would it have been recorded? Because the place it would have been recorded was in the Bible. And the Bible that we have is only really interested in portraying the national myth of Israel and the version of Hebrew religion that Josiah was keen to yeah. to promulgate, the, that that's what gets pulled together in the in the Babylonian captivity. So it, it might not have, it might simply not have gotten said, right? Um, or or alternately, like you know, the obviously the, the people can tell from the way that we're talking about it. There's we really like the the first temple religion uh, and the things that we like about religion. We can trace back to the first temple. Put it that way. Right. But but I, I think Barker would also agree if you're going to look at it as a historian, it it wasn't perfect either, right? Like oh, the, no. so, and, and as you said, it was very centered on the uh, on, on on the king. Um, and you know, I don't like having kings. So uh, <laughs> so I think what might happen is it's not just Jesus. Jesus. Have, and you, the have you ever really lived under a king, Jonathan? That, 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 that's a good point. Maybe I would love having a king. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, Jesus, Muhammad, um, the Kabbalistic and, and mystical rabbis, that what they're doing is is creating an open source version of the first temple, like actually in, in some ways uh, evolving first temple religion in, in, a, in a very uh, powerful way. Because, right. uh, you know, back in the first temple, there could only be one Christ, one anointed, right? But if you uh, look at the Gospel of Philip, well, you know, the point is, is not to worship Christ. Uh, the, the point is not to become a Christian. The point is to become a Christ. So at, at some point, or maybe many points, it, the, the technology becomes open source. Jailbroken, perhaps. It's, it's, yeah, like uh, Merkabah mysticism is, the, is, 
you know, beholding the, the cherubim throne. And the only person who was able to behold the cherubim throne was the high priest. Because yep. the only person allowed inside the Holy of Holies and that's where the throne was. So um, not open to everybody. Jewish mystics make that available to anyone that wants to do the practice, right? So there's there's jailbreaking happening all over the place. So yeah, it's it's a... I think it, you know, it sort of in some ways settles some mysteries about Gnostic material in general and Secret John specifically. Yep. And then it raises a whole bunch of other really fascinating, interesting questions for which there are no available answers. Um, and but it also makes it all just very sort of messy and problematic and difficult, and that's which ought to please you, right? Like it ought to please you because your situation as a human being here in adult life is messy and problematic and difficult. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, it's, so any account that makes it all look neat is going to be wrong. <laughs> yes. Yeah, a hundred percent. Do you want to uh, to try now? Now I know people have already made connections. You know, it's 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 getting pretty explicit between Temple Talk and and Secret John. But but are are there some points that really stand out for you? Like things that really jump out where you're like, ah, Temple, or like or or the Temple Talk, the Temple theology illuminates the text for you in in exciting ways, in different ways, in ways that open up your eyes. Uh, perhaps, you know, maybe you read the text before Barker than after Barker. Yeah, I definitely did. Um, the, well, the whole narrative of the, the one and the unfolding of the aeons, like the text avoids the word angel. Yes. Never uses the word angel. There are two kinds of celestial beings. There's aeons and there's archons, right? The, the archons are the depiction of post Babylon angels, and the aeons are the, the depiction of of the way the various celestial beings might have been conceived of beforehand. Um, so there's that. The it you know it does explicitly have um, well it's interesting right. So the the kind of the idea of God Most High, L, and Yod Hey Vav Hey, the the kind of the God for the people um, shows up twice because autogenes Christ is the good version of that picture. Yeah. The, the invisible spirit, the, the father, the, the unknown is the, is L is God most high. And then autogenes Christ is the good version of that. And Yaldabaoth is the bad version of that. Right. Yeah. So we sort of presented with two. It's not like there's, like a lot of the times when people talk about Gnosticism, they say, well, there's a high God and there's a low God and the low God's bad. Well, yep. But there's also another low God, right? There's also a kind of a, a step down version of the, of the, of the highest. Um, and similarly, there's Barbalo as the good version of the consort of the one or the consort of the father who um, is the creatrix of, uh, of autogenies. And then there's also Sophia who is, not a consort of anyone in particular <laughs> um and 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 look at what's happened to wisdom in the in the second temple version of things she's not anybody's consort particularly yeah. she's just wisdom she's just kind of floating around you know not in particular in relationship to anything you know she's just kind of she's not even necessarily exactly personified precisely except in that one um that one phrase in the book of wisdom that, that everybody loves so much um, so that's, a, you know, so we've got, we've got Babalo and Autogenes and Sophia and Yaldabaoth and the, the relationships are different and there's a, there's a parodic relationship between the two of them. Um, I think that stuff's all reasonably clear. I think the way Barker talks about, um, the Holy of Holies is kind of like a, a vision of day one, um, in the creation story prior to differentiation. Um, really, you know, that, that's very clearly mirrored in the way the, um, the one is talked about in the opening of Secret John. Um, that's really quite vivid. Yeah. There's a bunch of places where it kind of, it lines up definitely. Um, what, what sort of illuminated it for me? I think, I think that, that idea of the, the text functioning, you know, perhaps, perhaps in some ways like that, that way of thinking about it, that kind of you know, parody kind of rather than polemic, you know, as a, as a, as a mode of, of critical theory, if you like, a, around, you know, religious critical theory. 
possibly emerges in the reaction to the to the Babylonian version of Hebrew religion um, that comes back to the Second Temple. Um, kind of seeing that and kind of like understanding that that's the, that tradition of parody of making fun, really. It, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a hilarious book, right? Like yeah. it's very grim and, and sober in a lot of ways, but there's lots of bits of it where it's just like you chuckle almost, like it's hilarious, right? Yeah, it, um, it's very hard not to miss it that, that there is parody in it, right? Uh, so what, what it is specifically parodizing, uh, well, that's, that's what we're talking about now. And well, as we said, it could be a few different levels. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the, the antinomianism, you know, like the, the its opposition to authority, right? And yeah. and uh, particularly, like it's it's really quite polemic opposition to the authority of Moses and and the Moses texts, right? Yeah. Which which is often read as anti-Jewish in some way, and I that's not accurate in the time. I think yeah. it's because it's probably first century BCE. The the core text it's probably first century BCE. I think. Um, it's not anti-Jewish. It's anti that version of Hebrew religion. It's kind of setting itself as a as a as a, the other sister that gets it right, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah so th th that kind of like understanding the function of the parodic structure uh, and understanding kind of like why there's this good bad division and the purpose that it that it served in the in the tradition in which it came out of. I think is really helpful because that that really sensitizes you to how pervasive it is and you find more and more the deeper you look the more and more parallels you find between the first section of the narrative and the second section of the narrative and the more places you find those parodies showing up like i i, I, we've, I think i can't quite remember but i feel like we've we bumped into another one in the course of this conference i feel like every time i talk about it and we dig into the text it's like oh that's that's a parallel of that actually when you look at it oh that's a kind of a funny version of of this um so it sensitized me to that, and I think that's that's kind of uncloaked some other other versions of of the psychological dimension of it. And I I think fundamentally the psychological dimension of it is the the thing that we're alerted to. Like, I think you enter into spiritual life or to psychological healing, same thing. You know, like the same the same kind of journey. I think I think you enter into it with this sort of feeling that you know you are a bit messed up. You know, and I, I, I think I think when you begin it, what you imagine is that somehow um, you'll drive out all the messed upness somehow and you'll be yeah. purified into some pure, much better version of yourself. You'll be improved somehow. Uh, the Protestantism this is what you're talking about. You sit down, you find your sins, you root them out, and that's how you become a better person. Western, I mean, my, yeah. like almost all Christianity, really. Yeah. <laughs> You sit down, you find your sins, you root them out. You, you find out what, out what is bad about you, and, and you then you and then you push it away, or you push it down, and that always works really good. And make a fearless moral inventory. Um, yes. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's all through esotericism as well, this idea that there's the bad stuff and you've got to get rid of the bad stuff. And yeah. and the reality of the reality of of healing, of overcoming self-alienation, of overcoming fragmentation in the self. I, that's not been my experience. Like that's how it looks at the beginning, but then, but then I think you discover that these awful, monstrous, perverted parts of yourself are secretly these delightful, playful aspects of of your childhood. In fact, that have taken on an odd shape <laughs> yeah. from as things do when they're locked in basements for too long, right? Yeah. And and that as your relationship to those lost parts of yourself is gradually healed and made right, you discover that all the things that you began with were all meant to be there, but maybe they were just jumbled up in a funny way or not connected properly or not in appropriate alignment with everything else. Um, yeah. Look, I, think, I think that's the way that that's the, psychologically, that's the way that kind of, you know, in some ways, what we begin with is a parody, in a way, of where we where we end up. Yeah. It's not it's not wrong. It's just funny, actually. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. All and the all the rage and hatred and sexual perversion and weird obsessive social media habits, it turns out, are just funny. In fact, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's there are a lot of bad people out there, and I say a lot 
but they really are the minority, right? Most people are not murderers. They're not rapists. They're, they're not serial killers. Uh, they're not war criminals. So the things that we are deeply ashamed of and the things that we don't know that we're deeply ashamed of and the things that we think are our are sins, like when you tell them to another person, like you realize that, they're not, and that they're not, often they're not a big deal, or if they are a big deal, if they have caused you some problems, when you get to the root of them, it's not a big deal, and it's it's almost silly. So, it, you know. I've, 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 I've you know, in, in, in my mode of life, you hear the occasional confession, I have to say, and mm -hmm. confessions are always delivered with the greatest of, you know, they're heard with the greatest of solemnity, obviously, but they're often delivered by the person as like, oh, there's this terrible weight upon my soul and I really need to tell another human being. And then they voice it. And you just, I've never had a situation where I haven't just wanted to say, oh, honey. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel you, but it's not that bad. You're not that bad. Yeah. It's going to be okay. <laughs> I go, I mean, I'd almost go further and, and when you hear the actual life circumstances of some people who wind up in prison for murder, yeah. you know, or violent crimes of various kinds and not to diminish the pain and the suffering and the, the, the plight of the victims of those crimes to, at all. Right. But, but when you find out, whereas some of the, not all, again, not all, there's a small, there's a small group of people who, you know, whatever, I, I don't know people's exact circumstances, but when people that wind up in prison for violent crime, their life circumstances, the you know the way they show up on inventories for adverse childhood experiences, it's horrifying the stuff that people have often gone through early in life. Yes. And yeah. had they had the advantage of someone catching them, you know, in the sense of them falling, not catching them in the sense of a criminal, <laughs> early enough in life, and to just to just say, "Oh, honey, you're not that bad. It's not that bad." Yeah, yeah, that that's just How it. It's different. We we are agnostics, so you know we do we do know that the the world and our in our circumstances can can warp us, right? And that that is very you know that that's very understandable. And and again, uh, getting to getting to root causes instead of rooting out <laughs> um, uh, this this purging idea um, and this uh, this further division of an already divided being, which is all of us, <laughs> right? Into okay, this is the good parts of me. This is the bad parts of me. It, it, and often, and you know, this is both in Tantra and uh, psychoanalysis, that the parts of us that we think are the bad parts are actually the fuel. Yeah. You know, this is this is this is what propels us forward. This is what fuels our desire. Um, you know, all the weird sex stuff that we're all into, even if we don't want to admit it because we're all perverted beings. You know, that that that's one of the better known examples, actually, both in Tantra and <laughs> psychoanalysis. Right. But it's it's not the only example. But it's 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 the fuel. It's it's yeah. what powers the engine. Um and uh uh and, and of course that can be not always pleasant for you and can cause you some problems if if you don't understand what's going on and how your energies are being diverted and uh, what it is that you are actually doing why you're doing it and what you actually want and what you actually desire right we we get really mixed up in our in our desires um and sometimes just clarifying what it is that we're actually desiring can can do a lot for people uh, to, to to set us free, uh, to, you know, just like we're, we've been talking about for the last uh, the couple hours, uh, the, it all gets it's all tangled up in here. All tangled up. So sorting all it out <laughs> yeah. um, can uh, can can lead to uh, to, uh, to to quite a bit. Um, now, when I make statements like that, it it always sounds like, oh, I've achieved that, which of course, you know, I uh, haven't even come close. So. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I do struggle. I, I've come to struggle with, you know, like ideas about perfection and enlightenment and, and to distrust them quite a bit. Right. And, you know, I might have some solid reasons for that. But um, at the same time, I, I don't I don't even like perfectibility anymore. I, I And when I teach meditation, I try to even move away from self-improvement. So I'm trying to find a language that's still motivating because I, I think we can make progress i you know there is there is you know something that that we're getting to and we can get to uh what we may get to may at the end of the day particularly while we're in these bodies uh, you know still be a broken kind of triumph but but there is 
there is something to, to move that's towards. Very, very nice. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we we all, you know, those of us in spiritual leadership, you know, have, have a often have a tendency to kind of go, oh, well, I'm just a goofball and I don't know anything, and I, you know, I just, oh, well, it's not like I've gone anywhere or done anything in particular. I'm yeah. Definitely not a scholar, and I'm certainly not enlightened, and that, and you know, and fair enough. Um, I guess I, I guess I want to sort of come out a little bit and, and kind of say I have I have spent. 15 or 20 years on a long path of psychological healing. And I have done some of that work, right? And yes. um, it is absolutely true to say that there is progress, right? There's not, it's not like you go and everything's fixed, but I found a lot of those lost children, um, yeah. not all of them. And there's, there's parts of myself that I think I've spent most of my life denying and pretending weren't there and weren't, weren't me. And I've gradually found some of them and I've made them part of me. And I think, it's not fixing anything and it's not, I, I think the language that always resonates with me is, is wholeness. It's like there's parts of yourself that are lost yeah, or hidden or, or self-denied, fragmented and they're mm. hidden in a cloud behind a throne. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're repressed and denied and pushed off somewhere where no one else is meant to see them. And, and yet guess what? Everyone else sees them. Actually, you're the only one that doesn't. Um, and, and the process of, it's not pleasant finding them. It's not yeah. pleasant facing them. It can start to become pleasant reintegrating them. And then having reintegrated them, it's actually easy to, sometimes easy to forget that they were ever lost in the first place. But, but there's a more whole self that lies in the future of that work. And that self is more coherent, more able to be loving, more able to be good, honestly, effortlessly easily good without a lot of self-discipline um to to face people with more compassion and to face people with um i guess yeah more 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 coherence i think you make more sense the more of that work that you do you make yeah. more sense to others and you make more sense to yourself so there's definitely progress i don't know if there's an end point i can't <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I'm hoping there is, but I, I you know, uh, recently I've become doubtful. But yeah, I, I think there is progress. Also, the again, you know, I, I, I think this is the fourth time I've said it uh, uh, in these shows, which is, uh, I, I hate, I hate relying on cliches, but cliches are cliches for a reason. But the the existential Let's attempt. Call them traditions. It makes yeah, traditions. Sense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So a, a traditional saying, like, you know, the, the journey is the destination, which is sometimes it doesn't feel like you're making progress. Sometimes you feel like you're wasting your time. But the existential attempt, the existential moving forward, the doing the work is the work. Um, this is, this is w what, what life is and what life is for. So... At the same time, it, if you haven't reached that end point that you're that you're searching for, um, you don't want to give up because the moving forward is 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 part of the destination, and it's more than getting there. Am I making sense? I'm, yeah, I'm starting yeah. to sound like I'm in a dorm room right now, like just being <laughs> like, "Whoa, man!" Like it's not, dude. it's not, dude. But I, you know, I think that is one of the central, like, I'm tied into the book. Like, this is this is one of the central metaphors of of Secret John, right? Is that is that the the process uh, to ascend? You must descend. The the process is, is not only part of it, but the process is it. The process is it. I I think that's right. I think also, like, I think what helps in thinking about the the lifelong journey of this is to understand that there's other people walking beside you. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's what it's the company, it's the companions on the path that actually makes the path pleasurable to walk, you know? Yeah. I, I, it's, I, I think I also want to pick out the other, the other bit of inspiration for me in Secret John. This, this sort of reintegration of the self stuff is a crucial bit that I think is luminous in it. But yeah. the other thing, the other piece I think is the, is the, that beautiful depiction of the, the first father looking into the light water and, and that kind of like the birth of awareness, if you like. Yeah. And I, for me, I think this is the, these are the two dimensions of what, what the journey we're on is. And I think they're both crucial. One is, one is to discover your capacity to be aware of what your mind is doing, which begins with mindfulness. And 
ultimately ripens into awareness of awareness and resting is pure awareness itself to become the mirror in yeah. fact so to be able to to um without trouble regard the functioning of the mind and and to notice where awareness is going in itself which is a that's a developmental process of the development of awareness that's crucial right and that's yes. that's a part of coming to know the presence of the father in yourself if you like maybe yes of realizing and, and Oh, sorry to interrupt in a clarification. Now, it sounds like what you're saying is Buddhist talk, but this is this is Hellenistic philosophical talk. This is this is what all those guys in togas was talking about. Same, same. It's all the yeah. same. It's it's contemplation. It's what it's it's we're all talking about the same. We're talking about the same biz. There's a Indo-Tibetan version of it and there's a there's a Hellenistic version of it, and it's the same thing. Yeah. Um that's crucial, and this reintegration of the self is crucial. And the two things reinforce each other. Because the thing that the things that prevent you from you know, the, the people who've accomplished the kind of resting and bare awareness work kind of go, well, it, I didn't do anything. It was there all the time. I just had to let it be, tr you know, I had to realize that it was there all the time. And it was actually, I didn't create anything. I didn't make anything happen that wasn't already present. I, I just realized that it was already there, right? That's what everybody says once they accomplish it. Right? But that's imp that doesn't help. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, the thing that prevents you from realizing the, the, the some of the key things that prevent you from realizing it is is your own psych psychological lack of integration. It's your internal fearfulness and rage and pain and all that stuff, which prevents you some, some of the key things that prevent you from being able to rest in awareness and to and to experience your your the fundamental nature of your being as awareness itself. Um, so the, the psychological integration work is crucial for deepening into awareness, but also learning to more deeply rest as awareness gives you the safe place from which you can regard the need for psychological integration and to begin to do that work, which is why all, you know, almost all modern psychology kind of puts mindfulness practice as a key part of doing um, psychotherapy because it's just invaluable. It's the, it's one of the key things. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot more to unpack there, but that's probably for later on. Yeah. Well, we're at almost the hour mark of our third hour. So, uh, we, and I have to go to bed. <laughs> I think you have to go to bed and I have to have lunch. So let's, yeah. Let's, uh, yeah. But, uh, the, you know, that's, we haven't finished unpacking. Let's do it again sometime. Oh, that reminds me, mylandmeditation.substack.com. Uh, <laughs> 11 a.m. Sunday mornings, Montreal time. That's Eastern Standard time. That's uh, New York time. Uh, I, uh, we have a great group who will come out, and it's it's secular mindfulness meditation for about an hour. It's great for both people who are experienced and uh, newcomers. Uh, there's a, a good balance between instruction and silence, uh, guidance and silence. Uh, and it's, it's not specifically Gnostic. Uh, obviously, if you are a Gnostic, you will probably enjoy it. So uh, right now, it's entirely online. I'm going to go back to in person here in Montreal uh, but if I do uh, we will also broadcast it so you can always join in so check that out um, thanks so much your excellency we will do this again sometime I will keep bugging you to come on to have more conversations probably just about this text which we could talk about forever but maybe about something different who knows well I, I feel like we sort of tapped into the sort of beginnings of a conversation there about like what are we actually doing like what yes. are we actually talking about like we bang on about gnosis as though that's a thing that happens and we we bang on about the spiritual journey as though that means something um yeah. and i feel like we started tapping into kind of what that might mean and i i guess i have fairly specific views about that that aren't yeah. necessarily the same as everyone else's quite specific views but i think you and i line up on that stuff a fair bit yeah um because well, we've, we've gone through similar prior experiences so yeah, well, let's let's uh, let's do that sometime, and it, and it goes back again to to circle back around to to what I was saying about you know what what we're trying to do with the show lately, which is you know three things: how it started, an interview show; um, two, more on structured conversation, which is you know relatively newish, but you know something we've been doing the last couple of years; and three, something we've been doing the last couple of years. What does it actually matter? What does it mean? How can you use it in your life? Which you know it has been. Uh, previously a weakness on, on this show to be honest a weakness of my own because i want to talk about boring stuff with scholars uh that, that happened in the second century because i love that 
I love that. I do. I find it fascinating. But but I realize, well, you know, am I, is, is this, which I'm still going to do, by the way, we're still going to have shows like that all the time. But it is, it, it, could, could, could we be a little bit more helpful? Is, is, could we make this stuff matter to people who are not antiquarians, um, to, to people who, who are not scholars? And, and of course, obviously, I think the answer is yes. So yeah, we should, we should have a show where we just uh, work all that out. I mean, yeah, we completely, completely solve it, completely figure it out. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess we'll see. Yeah, but no, it, it's been great. And, and, and to come back to, I keep saying the central metaphor of this book, the central metaphors, you know, one of them is, is community. And I think one of them is knowing, the, you know, because of that harmonious relationship with the Aeons, uh, because Sophia creates without, without her partner, and, and that's viewed as an error, which is, you know, we find the self through the other. You know, we, we, we need the other. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's one of, one of the many reasons I'm not a monk. And, and, of course, monks, you know, we often think of them as just being alone in their cell with God, but they weren't. You know, the, even monks were finding themselves through the other. And, by the way, if, you, you know, if you're living that intensely with people for 50, 60, 70 years, you're going to learn a lot about yourself through them. And I, 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 I listened to an interview with Father Thomas Keating, um, God rest his soul, a, a few years ago, and he, he said, um, Don't get me wrong, the brethren are wonderful, but it is sometimes like being in, in six or seven bad marriages all yes. at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the I think people think that the vow of silence is is like a spiritual discipline thing, but it's a it's, it's so that everybody doesn't kill each other because if you're <laughs> you, you're just you're forced to bite your tongue. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, wrap up. Thanks so much. Thank much you very love. much. Much peace. Bye, everybody.